What happens when two quakes rattle the Pacific Rim within a heartbeat of each other? Does it hint at a hidden strain awakening across thousands of kilometers of tectonic fault lines? Could those jolts presage a far greater rupture yet to come? In the early days of October, two significant tremors struck in the Pacific Ring of Fire. One of magnitude 6.6, .6, about 26 kilometers, 16 miles, west-southwest of Ley, Papua New Guinea, at a depth of around 99.4 kilometers, 62 miles. The other, days earlier, a magnitude 6.0 event, some 56 kilometers, 35 miles, east of Tomioka, Japan, at about 46.8 kilometers, 29 miles, depth. Beneath the headlines and shake maps lies a subtle interplay of plate geometry, slab mechanics, and stress transfer. These back-to-back -back quakes may not be mere coincidence, but do they foreshadow a larger megathrust rupture? To answer that, we must dig into the geologic machinery. In the Papua region, the subduction of the Australia plate beneath the Pacific plate and various microplates forms a core piece of the Pacific Ring of Fire. Along the northern margin of the Australia Plate, a boundary exceeding 4,000 kilometers, about 2,500 miles, in length stretches from the Sunda, or Java, trench in the west to the Solomon Islands in the east, with the eastern sector alone spanning over 2,300 kilometers, about 1,400 miles. There, the Australian block dives generally northward under Pacific-affiliated lithosphere. The Australia-Pacific boundary is far from uniform. Segments host thrusting, others show strike-slip or extensional deformation, and microplates rotate between them. Along the South Solomon Trench, the Australian plate converges with the Pacific plate at roughly 95 millimetres per year. 3.7 inches per year, toward the east-northeast. This convergence drives a steady flux of strain into the subduction interface, and indeed over the past century at least 13 events of magnitude 7.5 or greater have been recorded in that region. Proceeding eastward to the New Britain Trench and adjacent sectors, the relationship becomes more intricate. Several microplates rotate, spread, or deform in response to the overriding convergence regime. Seafloor spreading in the Woodlark Basin to the south helps accommodate motion, while localized thrusting marks the boundary of embedded microplates. In these zones, strong quakes are not rare. 33 earthquakes of magnitude 7.5 or greater have been documented in the New Guinea region since 1900, with thrust mechanisms dominating. The area around Ley, Papua New Guinea, is deeply enmeshed in this complexity. The fault network is not a single planar megathrust, but a dense fabric of thrust zones, crustal breaks, and microplate boundaries. Within northern New Guinea lies a region of 2 to 8 millimetres per year, 0 0.08 to 0 0.3 inches per year, uplift of the New Guinea highlands, reflecting the shortening and crustal thickening spanning perhaps 250 to 350 kilometres, 155 to 217 miles of deformation enveloping the northern margin of the Australia Plate. When the magnitude 6.6 .6 quake struck near Ley at 99 kilometers 62 miles depth, it likely occurred within the subducting slab rather than exactly along the plate interface. Its depth places it in the intermediate depth zone, deeper than typical crustal events, but shallower than deep mantle tremors. Such an event likely represents intraslab compression or flexure as the descending slab bends under the weight of the overriding plate. The slab can fracture internally when it encounters heterogeneity or frictional drag, releasing stress in a brittle failure zone. 
This kind of internal slab rupture produces significant shaking but rarely generates large tsunamis because it does not displace the seafloor directly. On the Japanese side, the magnitude 6.0 quake occurred at 46.8 kilometers, 29 miles depth, well within the seismogenic zone of the subduction interface or adjacent crust. The region sits where the Pacific Plate dives beneath the Eurasian and Philippine Sea Plates, a junction long known for its destructive megathrusts and recurring interface quakes. Japan's subduction environment is a textbook example of seismic coupling, a cold slab, a locked interface, and continuous strain accumulation. The multiple smaller tremors near Onagawa, ranging from magnitude 4.5 to 4.9 at depths around 10 kilometers, 6 miles, hint at local stress redistribution or aftershock clustering. The Tomioka quake was far more significant in energy release and may have rearranged stress fields over a wide portion of the crust. What, then, connects these two seemingly distant events? Papua and Japan are separated by thousands of kilometers, yet both lie along the same planetary fracture belt, the Pacific Ring of Fire. While there is no direct mechanical link between them, their close timing reflects the global pattern of stress accumulation and release across interconnected plate boundaries. One quake may not trigger the other, but both reveal the ongoing transmission of strain through a vast and restless network of slabs and ridges. Deep slab events can alter the stress regime in the mantle wedge above. When a rupture occurs within a descending plate, it sends pressure waves through the mantle, sometimes perturbing stress fields in neighboring faults. In regions riddled with microplate boundaries, even a subtle redistribution of strain can nudge another fault segment closer to failure. Like a set of interlock gears, one turn or rupture transfers torque to another. Still, a megaquake meaning a rupture of magnitude 8 or higher, demands specific conditions. A large locked fault patch, decades or centuries of accumulated strain, and a structural geometry capable of sustained rupture propagation. In Papua, many of the region's largest recorded quakes have been thrust events at or near the subduction interface, especially near the trench cusp south of New Ireland. Historic records include the magnitude 8.2 quake in 1919, the magnitude 8.1 in 1971, and magnitude 8.0 events in 2000 and 1971 again. These monumental ruptures typically occur where slab geometry bends sharply and Asperity's strong locked patches finally give way. The Tomioka event in Japan represents a more typical rupture along the plate boundary. Stress release there may temporarily relieve strain in one patch, but increase shear stress on an adjacent locked zone, especially where the fault bends or branches. The series of aftershocks of magnitude 4.5 to 4.9 indicates a redistribution of stress and progressive adjustment of the crust. Yet none of these moderate events taken alone is capable of destabilizing the entire interface, unless one patch was already critically stressed. At depths of around 90 to 100 kilometers, 56 to 62 miles, such as the Papua quake, the subducting slab begins to experience dehydration reactions. Water trapped in hydrous minerals is expelled, migrating upward into the mantle wedge, where it weakens rock and facilitates both slab earthquakes and partial melting. Meanwhile, at shallower depths of 40 to 50 kilometers, 25 to 31 miles, as in Japan's event, stress builds in the brittle zone where rocks can still fracture elastically. When static friction is overcome, Rupture initiates, sometimes cascading along kilometers of fault plane at speeds approaching several kilometers per second. 
The mechanical chain reaction unfolds like this. The Australian plate pushes north-northeast, loading the interface, deforming the overriding crust, and flexing the descending slab. Once frictional resistance fails, slip occurs, releasing accumulated strain as seismic waves. These waves can transfer stress laterally along the plate boundary, possibly triggering adjacent faults. In the deep slab, fracture events can also send transient stress pulses through the mantle, subtly influencing the stress field of shallower segments. Further complicating matters is the non-planar geometry of slabs. In New Guinea, seismologists have identified slab tears, detachment zones, and microplate rotations that disrupt continuous subduction. The Australia-Pacific boundary here involves at least eight microplates, each moving with slightly different velocity and direction. This mosaic of motion results in complex strain partitioning. One block's relief becomes another's loading. The ramu Markham Fault Zone in northern New Guinea is a prime example of such deformation and remains under study for its seismic potential. Equally crucial is the seismogenic zone, the depth band where rocks remain brittle enough to rupture under stress. Typically, the upper limit is near the surface, at temperatures around 100 to 150 degrees Celsius, 212 to 302 degrees Fahrenheit, while the lower limit lies near 300 to 450 degrees Celsius, 572 to 842 degrees Fahrenheit, below which rocks flow plastically. The Papua event's depth of about 99 kilometers, 62 miles, likely places it below this brittle zone, signifying an intraslab rather than interface rupture. The Japanese quake, by contrast, at 46 kilometers, 29 miles, sits squarely within the seismogenic envelope. Does this mean the mega quake threat is real? In a way, yes. Every significant rupture is a reminder that these margins remain active and stressed. Strain is continuously accumulating, and the Earth's crust is always seeking equilibrium through periodic failure. However, predicting an imminent megathrust rupture remains beyond scientific reach. What can be stated with confidence is that both the Papua and Japan sectors are within long-term seismic cycles, and each new quake subtly reshapes the stress landscape of the Ring of Fire. History warns that megathrusts return in geologic rhythm. The 1906 magnitude 8.0 near Ley and the 1971 magnitude 8.1 near Kokopo both testify that these margins are capable of colossal ruptures. The only question is when, and which locked segment will break next. The back-to-back -back quakes of October serve as a vivid geological heartbeat of a restless boundary. They reveal how deeply interconnected the subduction systems of the Pacific are, how pressure builds silently over decades, then releases in violent bursts that remind humanity of Earth's ceaseless dynamism. Whether these latest tremors herald a greater rupture or simply mark another adjustment in the planet's mechanical orchestra, one truth stands. The Pacific Ring of Fire is alive, and its plates never rest. If you found this deep dive helpful and want to stay updated on the science behind these powerful geological events, please don't forget to like, share and subscribe, and tap that hype icon to help this video reach a wider audience. Every engagement helps keep scientific awareness flowing and supports more in-depth coverage of Earth's dynamic systems.